the go-ahead for manned flight had been given to Korolev at the end of 1960, and so he prepared his cosmonauts for the first manned orbit of Earth. At the climax of these preparations, the world was to see the images of a smiling young Yuri Gagarin boarding the bus that took him to the launch site, accompanied by his backup cosmonaut and staff from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. History in the making for we were under the impression that these were news images from the Soviet Union, and we didn't question the fact, why should we? The Soviet Union would enjoy beating the USA into space, and therefore we were absolutely certain that these events were and are recorded for posterity as they happened. Well, that turned out not to be the case. Our research has found that few of the film images of Gagarin's space trip were shot at the time. It seems they were pre-filmed during several different sessions over an extended period. These images were then subsequently assembled and then edited to produce a final result, certainly not true news gathering. That would explain, for example, the continuity errors in the bus sequence. Gagarin is embraced by key individuals, including Korolev himself. But new information reveals that most of this footage was not shot on the day of the launch. Gallantly waving, Gagarin enters the elevator to ascend to the rocket launcher and the Vostok capsule. We then see Gagarin getting into the small capsule and sitting inside the sphere that was to be his home for this highly significant moment in history. The lighting, though, gives away the fact that this was all staged. Here we can see the cosmonaut sitting in his seat, but there are two shadows, one on each side of his head, indicating that lighting was used from two light sources placed either side of the camera. The top view shows that there was no lighting inside the capsule itself nor was there any room inside the small space for the camera and lighting rigs required. So how can there possibly be a view of Gagarin taken from the front rather than just from behind his head? We must emphasize that there was no space for another person, camera or lights inside this miniature capsule. This shot alone demonstrates that he was filmed from a cutaway setup, on another occasion, in another place, in a studio environment. Details that have now come to light record that during the launch countdown, two awkward moments occurred. During the first of these, Korolev told the crew on the gantry that the hatch had not closed properly. This was news to them, as they had closed down all the bolts and no signals had activated to indicate any failure of procedure. Korolev insisted that the hatch be fully reopened and then rebolted, a task which added another 30 to 40 minutes to the countdown. Korolev also insisted that he alone would inform Gagarin of the delay. In fact, Korolev forbade the crew from speaking to the cosmonaut, who was supposedly listening to music inside the capsule. In so doing, he gave himself the opportunity to instruct Gagarin to leave, yes, leave, the Vostok capsule. The second awkward moment occurred during this rebolting procedure, when the gantry began to swing away from the side of the rocket as if the countdown had not been halted. Obviously the head of operations inside the launch bunker hadn't been appraised of the situation. About to fall off their lofty perch, the gantry crew hurriedly telephoned the launch bunker and asked them to return the gantry to the rocket side, allowing them to complete their task. So who was head of operations in the launch bunker? Well, actually it was Sergei Korolev. And he was totally aware of the timing of the countdown, since it was he who was responsible for the delay in the first place. So why go to the trouble of creating this gantry incident? We suggest it was a diversionary tactic, resulting in any observer taking their eye off the ball for a few vital minutes. This would ensure that the first publicized manned flight into orbit would not be compromised by a dead cosmonaut and it would have served to cover the moment when Gagarin was removed from the capsule. And ultimately, it would keep Korolev's research and development team ahead of their serious competition within the Soviet Union's internal space race. 
was Gagarin removed and then replaced by a surrogate cosmonaut? Or did the Vostok capsule go aloft with only a tape machine aboard? A technique that the Soviets had already honed to perfection and they had already acclimatized Western listeners to the idea that human voices emanated from probes officially classed as unmanned. Uh, but that's another story. This Vostok capsule landed on a designated site well away from the public gaze. In the meantime, Gagarin had apparently ejected himself from the capsule and landed well over a mile away. However, his method of landing was kept very quiet, creating confusion in the history books for years to come. The Soviets wanted to claim a flight record, and according to aeronautical rules, not astronautical, ejecting or bailing out would disqualify the entire flight, so the pilot had to land within his craft. Astronaut substitution would have meant that the number of people on the gantry platform would have increased or decreased between securing the hatch for the first time and the actual launch. Was this the case? Oh, yes, it was. It took five people to seal the hatch and check the procedures first time around, but at the second resealing, only three people were employed on this task. There was motive, opportunity, and time to accomplish the sleight-of-hand maneuver. And if such a tactic would ensure that the Soviet space program and their cosmonauts were kept alive, then it was worth the candle. Lord Bruce Gardine was at that time a journalist with the London Financial Times and until his death expressed grave doubts about the validity of the Gagarin flight. Throughout the spring of 61 he'd been in the Soviet Union and was in a Moscow alive with rumours about this event from April the 6th until his departure. On his way to the airport on April the 11th he was informed by his very well connected minder that according to his sources the flight had already taken place that morning. The source of this information had been none other than the chairman of the Soviet Committee of Sciences. Bruce Gardine, travelling in Germany the following day, was then very surprised to hear the Gagarin flight being announced live over the East Berlin Airport Tannoy system. Back in England, Jock Bruce Gardine established that NASA initially denied all knowledge of the Gagarin flight on the 12th. This statement was later corrected by the White House. But were the Americans, in fact, fully aware that the Soviets did not launch a craft on that day, April the 12th? No one's denying that the Soviet Union put the first man in space, but was that man's name Yuri Gagarin? <laughs>